Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Word. I'm Rashir. I'm going to talk about interpolation search. So let's do it. Um, about me, typical self-obsessed programmer starting off with himself. Um, this slide sums it up. I want to go fast. More specifically, I want to write fast code. I want to take code that is just an idea and make it as fast as possible. That's what I love about computers. That's why I do this. Um, and that's really what this is about, sort of less so than the specific search algorithm. This is about how we, and to be really clear, it's not just me who did this. I stand on the shoulders of giants. No person is an island, blah, blah, blah. I'm just the guy they put on the stage, um, <laughs> right? We took a research paper and we tweaked it until it became something that was actually fast and useful in prod. And the, paper, the paper's name is Interpolation Search for Non-Independent Data by some amazing folks at MIT, so check it out. I'll have a link later. So let's dive in. Um, what's the problem? It's a problem that I think many people or many companies have, right? You have a large static set of items that's huge, and it's sorted, and you want to do many searches on it. And obviously, like I said before, you want to do it fast. So what do you got? What was our old solution? A pretty standard thing, a sorted array with binary search. This is, a, this is an algorithm that many people know and understand and love. But can we do better, right? That's the question that we ask ourselves. And what does better look like? What do we want, right? Ideally, we want something better than the theoretical guarantees of binary search, so maybe better than like, oh, log n, that would be dope, right? Like low space usage, cache efficient, that would be awesome. And I don't know about you guys, but in the battle between intuitive and unintuitive, I always prefer the intuitive algorithm, so that would be amazing as well. So, okay, how can we use sort of those things? What do we know about the data that we have? We know its range, we know it's kind of random-ish, and, and then beyond that, we don't wanna be too clever, we don't wanna like try to fit to certain you know, properties of the data that it might have today, but not tomorrow, or the day after that, whatever, right? Like, you don't wanna be over smart. Um, okay, so what's, what's the main, what's the first idea? And this is from the paper, right? Bucket the data. And there's a pretty intuitive sort of human real world analog to this uh, show of hands, who's used a phone book sometime in the recent past? Wow, that's a lot of hands. <laughs> wow, I've never used a phone, wow. Anyway, so hypothetically, let's say I wanted to call Stevie Wonder and say that I loved him, right? Um, thank you, uh, right? What I would not do is pop it open and it's like, okay, J is less than W, so cut to the next cut and like O is less than W and then like T is less than W and then I'm looking and, and it's like, oh, Wonder's not in there because Wonder isn't his last name, right? Um, <laughs> what I would do instead, I would just hop to the Ws and search and fail there, right? But what's the point? The bucket tells you where to look. It, it provides a way to sort of really drastically reduce your search space, and it's useful. Um, so how can we use that? What is a bucket, though? Like, we gotta step back for a second, right? Phone books and things with words have letters, and so you can bucket by, like, the first letter. So, like, alpaca, alphabet, Arthur are all in the A bucket, and then, like, cantaloupes and Cactuses are all, I don't know, you know, Charles are all in the C bucket, but numbers aren't letters, usually. Uh, so, so what are we gonna do? So it's gonna be a different approach, it's gonna be a different kind of bucket. We'll have a range, like a min and a max in our sorted set, and we'll define buckets that evenly subdivide the range. And I don't know about you guys, but like I kind of glaze over when I hear about math. So now we're gonna go to visuals, and I made that. So just appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I got some hate for this, yeah, surprisingly. Uh, this is a sorted array. Uh, the red numbers are what's in the array, and then the little numbers, I don't know if y'all can see that. Can people see the little numbers on the bottom? Those are the array indices. Sweet, I had no idea if anyone could see that, so that's great. And this has a range of like one to 89. I, the parentheses says that like that's not part of the range, it's like a math thing. So let's say we want two buckets. Done. 
right? So the buckets cut the range in half. So the first bucket covers like 1 to 44, and the second bucket covers like 45 to 89. So the first bucket has all the numbers. It's like really wide, and the letters are all spread out. It's the first bucket. And then the second bucket only has sort of two items, and it's like kind of stacked and narrow. That's the second bucket. And we're going to need to store information about where each bucket starts and ends. But that's, that's how we would represent this sort of abstractly. So that's great. Um, and around this time, we had our second idea. And this one is going to blow your mind, right? The, the end of one bucket is always right next to the start of the next. At the end of the A part of the phone book is like the B part of the phone book. So we don't need to store the start and the end. We can just store the start of each bucket, which sort of halves our memory usage, which sort of doubles our cash efficiency somehow, and that's good. <laughs> that, those are good things, right? So what does that look like? So I've done this now. So this like upper smaller array, this tells you where each bucket starts and ends, right? So the first bucket starts at index 0 and ends at index 8. The second bucket starts at index 8, ends at index 10, which isn't a real index, but sort of it just works if you don't read past, you know, like if you know that 10 is one more than the length of your array, the idea that the, this arrow points to nowhere. Don't, don't read it. Um, <laughs> great. How would you use this in an example? Let's try to look up 27. So 27 is bucket 0. Why do we know that? So 27 minus the minimum value, which is 1, is 26, divided by the bucket width. So 26 divided by 44 is 0. So OK, that's bucket 0. Uh, that's that bucket that I circled which tells you to look at those two numbers that I circled, and then you can just binary search. So real quick recap, um, figure out what bucket you're in by like subtracting from the minimum, dividing by the bucket size. The bucket tells you where to start and end in your like thing to look, and then binary search. Um, why is this cool? Why is this cool? It's in the worst case, in the pathological case where all your data is in one bucket, um, it's just a binary search and a divide and a read. So it's not that much worse than just a binary search. That's not bad. And if the data is uniformly distributed, which I put in quotes because I don't know what it means, um, <laughs> then the lookup is actually a lot better than regular binary search. And it's O of log log of n uh, with uh, O of n log n buckets. I swear to god, I know how to prove that, but I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> trust me. Um, so this is where we leave the world of the paper. Right? And we ask, can we make this better? And when someone says something like that, I tentatively say yes. But you know, then I think about, what are the bottlenecks here? And it's like, computers don't love to divide. And I don't blame them. I don't love to divide either. Uh, <laughs> you know? So OK, uh, the divide adds latencies according to processors, like 30 to blah, blah, blah. Right? It's slow. So can we maybe not divide? And this brought me back to like fifth grade, and I know how to do this. x divided by y is the same thing as x times 1 over y. Done. Solved. Killed it. Um, <laughs> except not really, because 1 divided by y for computers is often going to be 0, because computers are not great at dividing. Um, but, but this approach is on the right track. You're going to need to think spatially, because I couldn't bother with latex. So x divided by y is the same thing as x times k divided by y divided by k. So like, just imagine there's a k and a k, and the k's cancel, right? So you're left with x divided by y. And if you pre-compute k divided by y, then it's a multiply and then another divide. But maybe if computers can really mess with k easily, like maybe if k is a power of 2, then this will be a good thing. It'll be a multiply and then a bit shift. Uh, right? Like, what's a million divided by a thousand? It's a thousand. Everybody knows, uh, you know, knows that really simply because we can just get rid of the bottom three digits. Computers do the same thing with powers of two. That's awesome. Thank you, computers. Uh, right? So two to the 64 will give us a lot. So now let's look at the code. This is my color scheme. It's like black and green and hackery. So appreciate that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, Right? So on top, I have the C code, and it does what we want it to do. Right? It multiplies uh, the multiplier, which is k over y. Can you guys see my mouse? Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah. Cool. Dope. Wow. This is awesome. Um, and multiplies it by the offset, which is k over y, and bit shifts by 64. 
And I removed the inline so that we can have our sanity with the assembly. Um, and what does it do, uh, blah, blah, blah. It does a mul Q, which is like an unsigned multiply of a quad word. Quad word means 64-bit uh, register in this scenario. And so what that gives us, right, when you multiply 99 times 99, the result is a lot. And it's also a four-digit number. So when you multiply a 64-bit number by a 64-bit number, you get a 128-bit number, the results of which are stored in two registers that are 64 bits each. And since we're going to bit shift down anyway, we don't really need to bit shift. Of, and then we can just keep RDX, which is where the high registers are stored. Um, so that's great. We've turned the divide into a multiply, which is like, kind of like a huge win. And now it's graph time because you want to see some proof and you want to know that I'm not just like full of shit. So uh, on top, on the blue line, is binary search. Uh, on the bottom is interpolation search. The y-axis is the number of, of, com of uh, comparisons. <laughs> and the, and the x-axis is the number of elements in your array. Often in graphs, more is better. But in this graph, less is more, which is better. Uh, <laughs> so. So you'll see that while the binary search graph goes up and to the right, the interpolation search graph stays like kind of straight and flat, which is a good thing. This tracks the difference between log, log of n, and log n, and this is what we expect. Um, so how much time do I have left? Zero? OK, can I have like a 30 second extra? Cool. So um, this is a tangent and unrelated to the talk. Uh, uh, so late last night at like 2.25 AM, I was trying to like spruce up my slides a little bit because I had some serious sort of self-doubts about these slides. It's 2.30 AM, I'm Googling gibberish, like what is buckets? <laughs> um, and I found the best image ever, like something way more meaningful than the whole entirety of my talk. That's what I want to leave you guys with, so this is it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, organizers. Thank you, Ben Khan. And I want to thank AppNexus for their sponsorship of this event. All right. <laughs>